Hi. I'm still trying to figure figure out what's going on with that stuff. One moment. You can talk to us and everything else. I'm just doing the producer thing here. Sorry. Which us. stuff? Can they hear me? Yes. You Okay. You just currently the the yeah, there's chaos on screen, but everything sounds mm. fine. Right. Hooray. <laughs> For so, technology. What stage of string have you string spring have you uh, encountered most recently? The birds are back. The birds, birds are, are back. back. It was yeah. The, all the birds are back. So we've got all of the the birds that show up in spring have all arrived, oh, and even awesome. swallows. And I I'm so glad. Like if anyone has any interest in this whatsoever, and if anybody ever goes through this dark the dark times of their winter. And you want to start putting things on your calendar. I'm really enjoying my my annual calendar. So the frogs started up just one night. They went from we could hear the occasional frog off in the forest <laughs> to suddenly the the con they're putting on concerts every night again. And oh. so it's just deafening. And it it was nothing and then deafening. That's the next night. Amazing. So cool. Yeah. And then all of the birds are back. Um more and more flowers for sure. Lots of crocuses have all come up now. Um, so now it's a race against time for me to improve my fence for the deer because the deer oh, yeah. are, are now licking their chops. And they they had a field day through the entire winter. There's <laughs> so many deer droppings in my garden through the winter time, And that there wasn't anything for them to eat. They ate a couple of weeds and, and yeah. mostly just mucked around. I've got lots of good stuff coming. And so I've right. got to get the the defenses up, especially we're heading out in three weeks to go to the eclipse. So yeah, I'm currently I mean, doing the tight. betting on when to plant peas game. We, you, you plant, you plant peas as soon as the ground is workable. You can plant really? peas in January. Yeah. But we're still going to get snow. Does it, peas peas, peas are care. badass. Yeah, All peas right. don't care. They get so, they get through that. So it is Sunday, absolutely it's bordering on too late to plant, plant peas because they don't like hot weather. And so you want them producing already by by early mid April. You're gonna have peas starting to you could eat if you if you had planted back in whatever January. So yeah, no, it's never too early to plant peas. If the ground is workable, put the peas in. And they will, and that way, you know, the water of the winter will keep them moist and they will, they will pop out when they're ready. So that's, that's what it's like for here. I mean, I guess like for here, say, I, I don't know Fahrenheit and I apologize. So <laughs> that's okay. I can translate. Like minus yeah. 10 degrees is fine. Peas can handle that. Okay. So, so 12 degrees here. Yeah. Yeah. But I, I don't even know what their lower limit is. So okay. the advice that we have here is it's never too early to plant peas. January is just fine. Okay. So yeah. my peas have not yet been planted. And right. so so I picked up the habit of doing raised beds from you. Mm -hmm. And the one thing that is a deep mystery to me with raised beds is where does all the dirt go? Cause like Well, it's the organic material is being consumed. And you're losing, so that is your, that's your key for how much organic material you should be adding to those beds. As the thing is settling, as the dirt is settling, because you don't want to, you don't want to mix it. You don't want to plow it. You want to, no. the whole point with a raised bed is you don't touch it. Yeah. So you have to layer on organic material on top of it year after year after yeah. year. So, so I put on, say, six inches sometimes even a foot of leaves on top of the raised bed in october like Our whenever the whenever the bed is done yeah. yeah yeah so gather it all up and you literally can't go too deep and then come spring when you're ready to plant pull it back to the point that you've got where you can i still need to um, add like three four inches of soil on top of all those leaves <laughs> it's just sort of like well you, how you does never this add happen? soil you never add soil on top of leaves because you don't want to bury carbon material into the ground because then it leaches the nitrogen. You only want to put carbon material on top. So so 
I would buy, like, I don't know how big your beds are, but I would buy a couple of bags of, for, of compost and just throw them because it's too late now. So I would just go with compost and just grab, generally, if you put like an inch or two of compost on top of your beds, Mm -hmm. then they will, that's sort of the amount that your beds are using. And then in the fall, when the leaves dump, you just pile them, like if it's two feet high of leaves, that's fine. The, the animals love it. The bugs love it. And then yeah. come spring, you can just, you can pull off a bunch of the leaves, pile them up somewhere and make leaf litter. But that's, you're losing that soil because you're losing organic material in the, in the soil. And that's what fluffs it back up again. So a couple of inches of, of compost would it's, be the way. It's just baffling. Cause like our raised beds are the ones that have the air gap underneath, like they're waist high and and it's just like every year i'm adding four to six more inches of stuff and where does it go yeah the atmosphere is the answer i understand that is the (laughs) yes the answer yeah but it's just sort of like it defies all logic and the amount of money i end up spending on dirt Yes, you don't want dirt. You don't need more dirt. Well, no, I I understand. I was just like incorporating all of the stuff that okay, I have to okay. buy as yes, it's a euphemism yeah. in this case. Yeah, I mean, you can definitely add. I mean, I, I don't or... like using peat moss. You can definitely add, um, but but you should only be amending on top. You don't want to amend. You don't want to mix stuff in. You so you just want to amend yeah. amend stuff on top and let it build up over time. And the plants and the bugs and the worms will all. Mix it all up. I guess we should do our job. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, oh, I still have to open audition. Hold on. And I somehow ended up with a mouse on both sides of my keyboard because one is my gaming one and the other is my like normal everyday one. And I was both handsing it. Um, all right. That was confusing, but only to me. So I will be quiet now. I'm also dealing with hay fever. Me too. Yeah. Yeah. You don't look it's like time. all swollen faced and blue eyed and red nosed um, yet. Not yet. No, but I've definitely last night again for the first time. I'm like, oh, allergies are back. Yeah. I woke up and it was just like this side of my head was like, no air shall pass. Thou yeah. shalt not pass. <laughs> you shall not breathe. Yeah. Uh Hello, Myth Town. Hello, Veronica. Hello, Null Denominator. Hello, Not the Brain. Um, all right, file new, audio file. Uh, app seven thirteen. Yes. All right. One more thing to open. Sorry, everyone. Mondays. Mondays. Some are worse than others. All right. Are you ready? I'm ready. I am pressing record on the audio. I have, I have pressed also pressed record, record on the video. We okay. Are, we are good. Here we go. Astronomy Cast, episode 713, an update on volcanoes across the solar system. Welcome to Astronomy Cast, our weekly facts-based journey through the cosmos, where we help you understand not only what we know, but how we know what we know. I'm Fraser Kane. I'm the publisher of Universe Today. With me, as always, is Dr. Pamela Gay. I seen your (laughs) sign. Shall I do the whole thing over again? No. (laughs) Rich can Rich can do this. My name is Fraser Kane. I'm the publisher of Universe Today. With me, as always, is Dr. Pamela Gay, a senior scientist for the Planetary Science Institute and the director of CosmoQuest. Hey, Pamela, how are you doing? I, I'm doing well, and I just want to put an extra special thank you to all of our patrons out there, because as spring hits, we are going to be asking far more of our editors than we do any other time of the year as the sniffles occur, and it's because <laughs> of you, dear patrons, that right. no one has to listen to this as they lay in bed trying to learn about the universe, because no yeah. one wants that. So thank you, patrons, and thank you for tolerating my mispronunciation of your names week And uh, and apologies in advance to everyone who's going to have to edit this episode for all the sniffles. So I've got something I want to announce, which is that on Saturday, March 23rd, 
will be the 25th anniversary of me founding Universe Today. Wow. 25 years That's of Universe Today. Amazing. Isn't that crazy? Yeah. 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 And it's it's kind of amazing that I still do the same job and I, I hope we're getting better and better over time. And uh that's it. That's all I, I haven't I haven't thought at all what I'm gonna do. Like maybe I'll do a live stream on Saturday on my YouTube channel or something just to hang out with people and and chat or whatever. I don't know. But it is kind of bonkers. And I mean, when we think about how long we've even been doing astronomy cast. Yeah. It's, it's amazing that you just keep showing up every day. And after a while, uh, you've done something for a long time. So we, 25 we years. Two years Being... away from 20 years of astronomy cast. Yeah. I think that means we need to start planning something. Right. <laughs> oh, I, I got to plan my own anniversary. Oh, yeah. Um, all right. So last week was one of the most exciting meetings we've seen from the Lunar and Planetary Science Conference with hundreds of announcements and discoveries from various missions. One theme kept coming up. The solar system is more volcanically active than we thought. Today, we'll explore volcanism on other worlds. And we will get to it in a second. But first, it's time for a break. And we're back. So I was watching... I go, not watching. I was browsing <laughs> through all of the presentations that were given at the Lunar and Planetary Science Conference. It took me about three hours to go yeah. through day by day, paper by paper, and and then shortlisting the ones that are stories that we want to report on at Universe Today. And I was on one page, I'm like, I want this. Ooh, I want that. Ooh, I want this. And then I got to the next page, I'm like, ooh, I want that. And I'm like, okay, we've got a problem. I so I just counted them up. I've got I've shortlisted 37 stories, which are the ones that I think are most interesting. Things like the icy origin of the Martian moons, uh, that there's probably no geologic activity at the bottom of Europa. Uh, that one crater on Mars created billions of subcraters. It just goes on and on and on. And so hopefully over the next couple of weeks or months, we will be reporting on these as we have time and, and budget to do this. What a week. Like, is this yeah. one of the most exciting weeks for LPSC that you've ever seen? I, I think that, Short of when they had a mission that had just done something especially spectacular, yes. There there were a couple of years where, like, there would be a mission track that was more exciting. But right. when it came to, like, full-on across the board, this mission really shone. And I also have to say, it, it stood out for... It had LPSC's classic humor. So, for instance, there are yes. two sessions side by side. One is Venus surface. Is it hot in here or is it just me? And well, that one had across the hallway, volcanism across the solar system. No, it's not just you, Venus. I love this back and forth in yeah. titles, in slides, in haikus going with the abstracts. Well, well, that was the thing you noticed that clearly there was a, I don't know whether it was a instruction it's from a the people organizing it. Okay. So all of many of the abstracts were haikus yes. or other forms of poetry, uh, which, I, which was pretty funny. So that's, they do that every year. I didn't realize yeah, that. Yeah. That's been okay. going on for years and it just gets a little bit more um, spread across the community year after year. And I, this was perhaps the best hybrid meeting I have ever attended. I got press registration for the conference. It was held through VFairs like just about every other conference on the planet has been since the pandemic hit. But what made this really good was they took the time to make sure that they acknowledged the virtual audience, included the virtual audience, mm. and stayed on time so that you could actually jump between sessions. And it was just extremely well done. And then they left all the recordings up. 
which yes. benefits both the people who went and the people who were virtual. Because no matter which one you were, you can go back and watch the sessions that you weren't able to see because both the Venus volcanism and the volcanism everywhere else were held at the same time. And that's rude. Right. But yes. okay, because of how they organized this. So I just want to say kudos to everyone at the Lunar and Planetary Institute. This was the best virtual conference I've attended so far. Wonderful. Yeah. Congratulations to everybody involved. Uh, it, you know you're doing it right when, the, from a reporting sense, the worst place to be is at the conference. Yes, because the, the, that that if you just stay home, you've got your coffee, you got your slippers and you've got live feeds from everything that's going on, then that is the best place to do your reporting yeah. on the news that is coming out of the conference. It's the worst place to interview people and make those personal connections. But still. All right, let's get let's get on with the actual task <laughs> at hand, which is um, when we are not uh, celebrating the LPSC. We are talking about volcanoes across the solar system. So what's the new stuff that we learned this week? Um, I, I think the one that caused me to simply like stop what I was doing and focus momentarily just on LPSC was IO has moving and major hotspots. Uh, we're getting those results from Juno, which is also on the chopping block. That was also announced. So like, yeah. And Chandra. Oh, uh, Juno, that's Chandra, and Maven are all uh, oh. being shut down uh, circa, uh, what was it, Tw uh, fiscal year 26, uh, oh. give or take a fiscal year. Uh, Hubble is getting a 5% reduction. Uh, they said that JWST continues to remain over budget. It's just what it's going to do. Um, right. All right. So yeah. Focus. We focus, are we are focus. focusing on volcanoes, <laughs> family. Volcanoes so, on Io, moving hotspots. What's going on? Uh, it's this is a world that there aren't necessarily conclusions yet. There is just data, and we have the same thing coming to us from Venus. So there are hot spots. These are places where your lack of tectonics allows. Uh, the version of lava they have on Io to pop out through the crust of Io. Um, and every time something new flies by that little world, we are able to map out. And because of Juno's orbit this year, once a month, it is going past Io, or actually this was true for 2023, every month mm -hmm. it's going past Io, and it was getting a little bit closer and a little bit closer until it made its closest approach in December, perfectly timed for this conference. And they were able to see how the world evolved, how things heated up and cooled down over time. Um, there's going to be papers coming on this. They're not there yet. But seeing the images with the hot spots all over them just really took my breath away. I was able to interview one of the people working on the research of, of IO. Yeah. He was one of the people behind the proposed IO mission that didn't, you know, that hit the chopping block instead of two Venus missions. Yeah. And so one of the really interesting discoveries that they're making about Io is it looks like there is a single contiguous connected magma layer, one big magma chamber that is connecting all of these hotspots and volcanoes together. They're all drawing from the same pool across the entire world and not just magma chambers that are connected underneath one hotspot. And that's really interesting. It's the equivalent of the under ice oceans on Europa or Enceladus or Callisto or Ganymede and so on, that you have that version on Io, but it's made of rock, molten rock. You know, I don't think there's going to be any Ionian rock whales swimming around inside those magma chambers, but no. you know, you never know. There's, that's great. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I would say that's the, that is the big one, but uh, you know what? We, we're we're, we're going to shift gears and talk about Mars in a second, but it's time for another break. And we're back. So this was a story that I did not expect us to be reporting on. And this was 
a brand new, previously unseen, enormous shield volcano on Mars. That there are now five yeah. giant shield volcanoes on Mars and not four. Yeah. And and I have to admit, you probably know more on this story than I do because I went down the Venus rabbit hole. And okay, there was sure. so much coming out of this meeting. It's going to take both of our brains to get through all of it. So I'm going to hand Mars to you. Okay, let me just grab my... Okay, let me grab my document here. Give me one second. Um... Thank you, patrons. <laughs> right, so you know we obviously know about Olympus Mons, and then there's these other three volcanoes on Mars. There's Ascreus Mons, Pavonis Mons, and Arcea Mons. And those are the four big super volcanoes, the big shield volcanoes on, on Mars. But it turns out there is a fifth one that they're calling, well, they don't have a name, uh, but it's in the Noctis Labyrinthus region of Mars. And this is this, this sort of right at the very end of the Valles Marineris. If you sort of imagine the Valles Marineris is like this, this huge valley that is moving across Mars and at one end leads into the Tharsis bulge where all of those big volcanoes are. And right at the very end of the Valles Marineris is this very complicated kind of maze-like terrain that they're calling, that they've called Noctis Labyrinthus. And there's been plenty of, you know, we've re reported on it. It's really interesting, fascinating terrain on Mars. And what they found was that, that this terrain is actually a heavily weathered shield volcano that has been there in plain sight all this time. It's just that the, with the other ones, because they're in the bulged up terrain, they're a lot more obvious on the surface of Mars, while the the one that's hiding inside this Noctis Labyrinthus region, there's you know a lot of material slumped down, a lot of cracks formed, and so it's a lot harder to see. But it still is eight thousand meters tall, so it is it is the height of Mount Everest. But that's nothing when you can imagine Olympus Mons can be tens of kilometers high. So, uh, so yeah, brand new volcano on Mars. The size of Everest, which is allowed because the gravity is so much lower on this world. Mm -hmm. And and when we think of planets as being round, Mars is here to tell you that they're the shape of Plato shaped like a, by a small child. Tears yeah. and mounds alike. Yeah. All right. You were focusing on Venus. Let's talk about Venus. Yeah. So the thing that really got me about Venus is they've been looking at these crony, these they they are basically circular-ish structures that then have what looks like the solar cor corona on the surface of of Venus. We see them in radar images. We can't see them directly because of the expletive clouds. Um and the more we look like conservative estimates are there's over 450 of these. That's mm. conservative estimates. Yeah. It is unclear how currently active these are, but it is thought that within recent geological times, some of these things have been going off. And they're trying to figure out how to explain the surface of this vaguely Earth-sized world that doesn't have plate tectonics, that is rotating slower than its year, essentially. And right. how do you put all of these pieces together? Two of the big results that stood out to me, there was uh, one grad student who was willing to stand up and say, I have a controversial idea and I want your feedback. Tell me where I'm wrong. And it was, it was brilliant. You have to compliment any scientist, especially a young scientist, who's willing to stand up and do that. And yeah. what he had looked at is when you find craters on Venus, when you look at the pattern of detritus around the crater, they are elongated. And you would expect the elongation to be uh, related to the wind, which is primarily in one direction and uh, related to things like rotation of the world and stuff like that. And 
mostly you see that until you start looking at things statistically and your your brain is like, oh, they're all perfect. And then your statistics are like, no, no, actually they aren't. And hmm. he was able to find degrees of not aligned with the winds and the rotation that he thinks may show that the current orientation we see of Venus upside down, rotating wrong, uh, is as suspected due to massive rearranging of the planet's alignment and see that reflected mm. in the elongation of the detritus around craters. And Oh, that's really interesting. Yeah, that that this would still be reflected in the surface of the world is like, I want high resolution radar. Get yes. me the high resolution radar. Yeah. Um, and, and that's those missions that I mentioned before, yeah. the the Da Vinci and the Veritas missions that were the ones that were chosen over the IO mission. Right. These are going to get us the high resolution images of the surface of Venus. It, it's amazing how low, like we have resolution on the surface of Venus, which is in the hundreds of meters to single oh, kilometer yeah. scale compared to Mars where you you're down to the tens of centimeters same thing right. with the moon right totally different level of depth and that's just because as you mentioned those awful awful clouds block any attempt to to perceive it from space you have to use uh lidar laser imaging like what they did with the Magellan mission no they used yeah. these they used radar, radar? they used radar for yeah, yeah, yeah they used radar for Magellan um and and this was previous to this LPSC meeting, but researchers saw, could see volcanic activity on the surface of Venus. They were able to see bulging vents, the kinds of things that we saw in the lead up to Mount St. Helens. Yeah. That just in the, in the time that Magellan back in the, what, 1990 was, yeah. was taking its radar images from one sweep to another one. People were able to see changes in the surface from volcanic activity. So we know, although it, there's no active volcanoes that we can really see, there is definitely some level of volcanic activity on the surface of Venus. And that hopefully gives us the story about, about just how active this planet is. Will it erupt in the future? When did it shut down? When did its, its like uh, run of a greenhouse effect begin? And yeah. this is all piecing into the story. That's really cool. And a along with this was news that Veritas has been refunded by NASA. And while Da Vinci is delayed, it looks like Da Vinci and Veritas will both be go with launches mm. circa 2031, 2032. And Europe is continuing with Envision and NASA is continuing their partnership. And the the other talk on, on volcanoes on, or I guess impact detritus isn't so much volcanoes it simply snuck into this episode the other volcano on venus story that really caught my attention was uh so in trying to figure out what's going on with this crazy surface there there are faults these long linear features and we see things like this in iceland where the the grindavik uh complex of eruptions mm. is coming out along these fissures well what they've been doing is looking at the slope of of these crony that aren't always round in fact a lot of them are very much elongated and by looking at the orientation of these elongated crony relative to the nearest fissures uh faults linear structures we're figuring it out from radar um, they were able to, to find that the crony are largely aligned with the nearest linear faulting features on the surface of Venus that says these are related structures. So mm. these cracking structures, uh, it's, it's all sorts of really cool volcanism related geology and that's new and super cool. And that, it's interesting, I mentioned earlier on, we were talking about the Mars volcano, that you've got this connection between the, th the Tharsis bulge area and that cracking 
Cabalas Maranas. Terrain. Yeah. And then connecting up to the um to the Vals yeah, to the Vals Marineris. Yeah. That that these these systems are linked and that there are larger scale processes happening on this world that after a while you can start to see the big picture as you get yeah. better and better data. It's really interesting. All right, we're gonna take another break. And we're back. All right, let's shift gears then and look at cryovolcanoes. They're a type of volcano. Yeah, and and I have to admit, in prepping for this show, I, I learned something that I probably knew and forgot. I Apparently, at a certain age, you get to start relearning things and being excited all over again because you forgot the first time you learned them. Um, and, and for me, that new thing that I learned was... Triton's volcanoes were originally spotted doing their ejecting stuff back in 1989. So when yes. we were in high school was when cryovolcanoes were discovered. And it wasn't Europa. It wasn't Enceladus, these ones that we talk about all the time. It was Triton, this captured Kuiper Belt object yeah. that's bigger than Pluto had a, a water ice plume that <laughs> was spotted in the 80s. Yeah. So this kills me. So <laughs> I have not forgotten. I bring this up all the time. So when Voyager 2 flew past Neptune uh -huh. in 1989, it saw substantial evidence of geysers at Triton. And they identified it at the time and they they wrote it down and they said, Pamela may forget, but the rest <laughs> of us will never forget this. There is There are ice volcanoes in yeah. the solar system. And then they said, did we see that at Europa? And we're still not sure. And people have attempted yeah. to try and detect them at Europa. It wasn't until Cassini went to the Saturn system and actually saw the active cryovolcanism on Enceladus that you got this just unquestionable proof that you have yeah. ice volcanoes in the solar system. But the original version of this is what's happening over at Triton. So did we learn something new about these this cryovolcanism on Triton? I, no, I simply, in prepping for this show, <laughs> learned okay. that and wanted okay. for everyone else in our audience to to right. share in the delight that we've known about yeah. these suckers since the the eighties. What we and, learned... and this is go ahead. Well, I was going to say this is one of the big reasons why a mission to Triton was the yeah. other mission that got passed over in favor of the two missions to Venus. It was two missions to Venus a mission to Io and a mission to Triton. And then it was yeah. the, the two Venus are go and the Io and the Triton missions are, who knows what's going to happen to those. The Chinese are planning on building a mission to Triton. Every few months we report on a new potential idea to go to, to go to Triton. People are trying to yeah. figure out ways. Could you like arrow break in the atmosphere of Neptune while you're arriving in the system? Like maybe there's some clever way. Could you use yeah. a solar sail? How can we do this? Because Triton has all of these mysteries that we really want to try and understand. And, and we want to so do it in away. our own lifetime. And that's yeah, it's the so problem. Far away. Yeah. Like, like you could get there if you accelerated halfway and you decelerated halfway. But then we will be dead when. Yeah, this isn't the expanse. The right. 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 So, but you were going to mention some additional information oh. about that. Yeah, so, I mean, here's the thing. Cryovolcanoes didn't really come up a lot in this particular uh, uh, LPSC, except insofar as what the heck is going on at Europa continues to be a theme. And it sounds like you already did an interview on this, or at least went down the rabbit hole on this. Uh, yeah, I, I go down the rabbit hole on Europa all the time, but the the one piece of news that came out it's kind of bad news is yeah. that that it doesn't look like there's the level of of geologic activity at the bottom of Europa that we would want to see to be able to be injecting large amounts of of hydrogen gas and 
various elements required for life into the system. Like at the bottom of the ocean here, we see the black smokers right. with these really vibrant ecosystems around them. And that's how a lot of material, it's even thought that maybe that's the origin of life on earth. And so the expectation is, okay, if we're seeing, we know there's a subsurface ocean on Europa, we know one moon next door with Io, it's, it's experiencing tremendous tidal flexing. Couldn't Europa have yeah. volcanic activity as well? And now it's starting to look more, more like it's looking like there's less and less volcanic activity on Europa than what we would hope. And and this is one of these things where I honestly see this as an evolving story. Because yeah. with Europa, what we've seen over the years is discussion of how thick is the ice, with estimates going from hundreds of meters in the uh, least thick sections to tens of kilometers in the least yeah. thick sections. And there, there's a lot of give or take between those estimates. We look at the surface and we see these chaotic regions and, and the question becomes what kind of forces, what kind of hydraulics is causing this? Um, and so we're trying to understand what's going on at the center of this world from computer models that have as their comparison data, can they reproduce what we see at the surface? And we don't fully understand what we see at the surface. So I put this in the category of um, put bigger question marks next to your cartoon graphics of hydrothermal vents on Europa. Yeah. But don't give up hope yet that, that our right. models have room to allow them to exist. Yes. Um, war, was there anything else related to volcanism across the solar system you wanted to bring up? I mean, there was many more stories. I mean, we yeah. are just touching the surface of this. So the moon was a recurring theme. Anytime someone could possibly mention Artemis, they did. Yes. Um, it, it turns out that in coming years, the great source of planetary science funding in the U.S. is going to be the Artemis program. And this means that we saw a bunch of presentations on things like uh, updated catalogs of lunar silicates, of uh, yeah. where are all the shield volcanoes, uh, what about mud volcanoes, um, all these different things just kept coming up. And, and what I loved is they would go from discussing, here are all the things that we're going to finally be able to put astronauts on the moon to go walk up to and then they would sneak up on and mars is the final destination and switch gears violently to right. and hey um what is the mix of things over on mars but it's easy to look at the moon and forget in this landscape that is so shaped by craters that not all of the craters are impact craters. There mm. are volcanoes. Very, very dormant. Very, very dead. I'm not even going to go with dormant. Just dead. Very yeah. dead volcanoes on the moon. But they're there because this was a once molten chunk of Thea and Earth that got bounced off and had to solidify. And it solidified from the outside in. And that led to volcanoes. There was some research that came out a couple of months ago where researchers looked at areas that had had landslides in recent periods yeah. because the moon is still cooling, it's still, it's still shrinking, yeah. and you've got areas which are cracking, and you've got places where you got the side of a crater, or whatever, it's exactly at the right angle to hold, and then as soon as you get the slight shrinking, a slight earthquake, a, a moon quake, then you'll get a landslide. And they actually mapped out all of the places that could have potential moon slides so that it, when the Artemis folks arrive at the moon, you want to skip. You don't yeah. want to be in an avalanche oh. of, of regolith. And so they've they've identified all of those danger spots to make sure that you avoid them. Well, it's been interesting. And, and as I mentioned, this is just a fraction of the story. So hopefully you'll see our coverage at Universe Today. 
Pamela, I know you've been doing a lot of reporting and we'll continue to digest. I wouldn't be yeah. surprised if we continue to talk about this in the coming uh, weeks and months. This one's this one's going to take a while to fully sort of work its way through the yeah. system. So thank you, Pamela. And thank you. And thank you again to all of our patrons. You are the reason that everyone is not being subjected to hay fever related sniffles. Um, to to all of you out there, uh, I wish I could thank all of you by name, um, but I at least get to thank some of you by name. This week, I would like to thank Antisor, Matt Rucker, Mark Stephen Rasnak, Abram Cottrell, Shersum, Alex Rain, Andrew Stevenson, Paul Hayden, Stephen Coffey, the lowly sand person. I'm sorry, that one just has to be said in a fun voice. Uh, Bart Flaherty, Benjamin Carrier, Jim Schooler, Daniel Loosely, Gregory Singleton, Tim McMacken, Kenneth Ryan, Ninja Nick, Michael Regan, J. Alex Anderson, Bruce Amazine, Scott Briggs, Frono Tannenbaugh, whose name, I'm sorry, I you spelled it fanatically in ways I don't understand. Jim McGeehan, uh, Planetar, Father Prax, Glenn McDavid, Smansky, the Air Major, Nyla, Lou Zealand, David Gates, uh, Georgie Ivanov, Justin Proctor, Matthias Hayden, Scott Cohn, Marco Iarossi, Matthew Horstman, Scott Bieber, and the Big Squish Squash. That one just brings me joy. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. We'll see you next week. Bye-bye. All right. And then they saved. And then they saved. Seven, one, three. Sniffle. Oh, and yeah. now here comes the sniffling after you My head saved is it. so full of allergies that are like trying to push all the science out. Um, all right looking for questions in chat sneaky mons is the way z zinc responds to the mars stuff john suffel asks in a recent podcast anton petrov said that betelgeuse is no longer just a star it's more of a pulsing plasma cloud could you yeah, explain please yeah yeah so uh, we covered this quite a bit recently the the gist is that Betelgeuse, one of the surprising things about Betelgeuse is that it rotates at five kilometers per second. And this is a star that is the size of the orbit of Jupiter. And it is never been seen before and is a shockingly fast rotation speed. And people are wondering, like, how is this even possible? Maybe it consumed a partner star. But some researchers said, well, maybe it's actually not rotating that quickly. Maybe it's due to convection cells yeah. in Betelgeuse that are mimicking this rotation. And they found that you can have these convection cells dropping and rising at 30 kilometers per second, which is fast. The and, illustrations are amazing. And sunspots on Jupiter can be two thirds of the size of, sorry, sunspots on Betelgeuse can be two thirds the size of Betelgeuse. And so you've got sunspots that are millions hundreds of millions of kilometers across with the gas falling or rising at 30 kilometers per second. And this might explain that we thought, you know, astronomers thought they were seeing rotation, but they were actually seeing giant convection cells rising and falling. And that's, that's a possibility more, a better, better analysis is required. Yeah. It's the, the, the thing to remember when they refer to it as a ball of plasma is these giant red stars. Uh, Myra variables are another example of this. Um, once you get to this phase, they're either gearing up to go supernova or gearing up to release their atmosphere, depending on what kind of red giant they are and what the original mm. mass was. They're gearing up to shed their atmosphere one way or another. And the the density of the outermost layer is like the kinds of densities we're used to experiencing here on Earth. Yeah. Um, this this is basically a star made of fog at the outermost layers. Yeah. When and, you think about the like the say it's 30 25 times the mass of the sun. Yeah. but fills up the orbit of Jupiter. 
that is a very not dense not dense undense star yeah totally um how mckinney asks is there a threshold amount of mass a planet needs to create or sustain lava cycles um no what well i mean you have to be big enough to be differentiated and probably spherical so you're looking at series is probably vesta is right under the line let's go with that mm. vesta is right under the line you need some sort of a heat driving something going on. So what Io is experiencing is its orbit is ever so slightly elliptical and that ever so slightly elliptical causes the pull on it to vary and it basically is going squishy, squishy, squishy. And if you take a rubber ball and you bounce it a lot, especially if you have one of those paddles with a really short elastic, you can actually feel it heat up. Mm. That elliptical orbit is heating up Io the way going wacka, 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 heats up the, the rubber ball. And right. it's that heat that is driving the volcanism. If you can take a smaller object, put it in that kind of a um, slightly elliptical, um, right tempting fates getting near its Roche lobe limit, um, you can do this to all sorts of different things. It's hmm. really cool. That is really cool. Um, and then Hal McKinney also asks, could we make probes that can survive submersion in volcanic lava pools? Not yet. Do we do, we do that on Earth? No. Are there any probes that can go into? No. Not lava. I so mean, what nothing, we have the there's no metal that do. we have that can handle. Yeah. Yeah. So we have mud? the capacity to send humans who are very brave or stupid um, or drones that are very rugged up to the edge of a lava flow and they will shove something in and pull it out quickly and grab themselves a scoop of lava. Um, yep. and, and we do that on the regular. But in terms of like walking up to a crater lake like at Haleakala or something and throwing in a drone that can send back data, no, that is molten rock. It will melt our yeah. equipment very effectively. It is thou thousand. What is it like? It depends on the twelve hundred. It depends on the yeah. It depends on the, but it is well over a thousand degrees centigrade, yeah. and we don't have anything that can handle that kind of temperature. Like everything will melt in Parker's that kind of temperature. Parker's solar yeah. probe is able to do what it does because the ability to transfer heat is dependent on particles colliding with Parker solar probe and it's kind of sort of close to vacuum where Parker's flying by so the yeah. incident transfer of heat isn't as great as it could be it's just getting blasted by light and some particles hmm. um but the the heat capacity of lava its ability to transfer that heat to whatever you throw in it um I'm pretty sure even Parker would go nope I'm out yep uh well, those are all the questions that we have on on YouTube. Over on on uh, Twitch, uh, they are commenting on our discussion and agreeing on the uh, allergies being a thing right now. Right. So we've got a couple of minutes left. Did you watch Starship launch? Yes. I, I have a rant here. Mm. It's my turn to have a rant. I'm yeah. actually going to write this up. So... A few months ago, there was a, a Japanese attempt to land on the moon that did not go 100%. Prior to launch, they had a whole bunch of, these are the things we're going to try and do, the points we have allocated them, and how we defined success. And so they were able, using their pre-published rubric, to say how successful they were. Mm -hmm. Now, since then, we have seen another mission flip on its head. We have seen one fall on its side. We have seen them lose Starship entirely in the atmosphere and drop its booster into the ocean at Mach 2, if telemetry is to be believed. And they have, after the fact, claimed all of these things are successful. They claimed Peregrine, which didn't get out of Earth's orbit, was successful. And right. they're not publishing the rubrics ahead of time 
And I'm sorry, but you can't just call hmm. absolutely everything a success if a commercial carrier gets off the surface of the planet, which appears to be the current metric for success. So here's the thing I want to ask. That Japanese mission last week that blew up a couple hundred feet off the launch pad did deploy its satellite into the <laughs> lowest orbit a satellite has ever been deployed into if right. a ballistic orbit counts as successful deployment. Do we right. call that a success? No. No one no. would agree that that was a success, despite the images of the successfully deployed in an explosive manner, not entirely on purpose, satellite. So yeah. if if we're going to call things success, we need to have predefined criteria or success is actually accomplishing what you published with your mission goals. Starship's mission goals was a 65 minute flight that had soft reentry into the surface of the ocean and the booster returning for soft reentry into the Gulf of Mexico. Neither of those things happened. When the FAA has to have a crash investigation, I would argue you may have learned things, but if you didn't publish your rubric ahead of time, it's not a success. So start publishing your rub rubrics or stop calling things a success. Pick one. Channel that little Japanese team with their cute little rabbit logo and have a rubric ahead of time. All right. I will but step back. Starship made it to orbital velocity. It it did. Well, yeah. rotating out of control. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. No, under, understood. And, but they hurled where the heaviest rocket. Yes. The heaviest payload ever mm -hmm. thrown into space. Mm -hmm. They did it. It was spectacular. My argument yeah. is you have to say what your criteria for success are before you take off. I sh fine, but I, but I, I <laughs> like I feel I feel like when I am developing on a computer, mm -hmm. my criteria of success is does is the whole thing still stable and now I've fixed one more bug? Is the whole thing stable and now I've implemented one more feature? Am I moving in the right direction? Is for me because it's it can never. I mean, you can make sure that it is absolutely right the first time around, but that just costs so much more money oh, than I agree. doing the iterative approach. I have no approach. problem with incremental development. Like yeah. I said, my issue yeah. is they need to define success a priori, not post hoc. Did, Zafan Zafan is saying exactly right. Did you get further than before? But they didn't say that was their goal. They said I, and, their goal yeah, was a 65-minute flight. Yes, but my... I don't care what they the, like. They said that's what they're hoping for. But the question is, was it better than flight two? And I think yes. C c the booster lasted longer. Starship made it to orbit, and then and gave us the first live images of plasma forming around the front of the rocket. But it got farther, and so in my opinion, it was a glowing. It was a success. It literally it was glowed. A, it did. It, that's it yeah. That's the only reason it was a glowing success. Yeah. Did it meet all of their criteria? Of course not. But, <laughs> but that's why they have yeah. they have more and they're doing more testing. And right now today, you could have put a giant space telescope into the payload bay of Starship, and you could have launched it, and it would have been the most powerful method of of launching heavy Put payloads into, into space ever done controlled orbit as the starship spun sure, sure it's not but they need to carry things please please no, don't threaten I... space telescopes that way no <laughs> of course not of course not so so the, i i guess for me yeah it is just it's of course it's black and it's not black and white of course it's shades of gray yeah and the same thing japan they <sighs> They landed at a pinpoint location for the first time on the moon. Yeah. It was the first lunar lander sent from Japan. Yes, it landed upside down, right? Yeah. It, yes, it did not get steady power into its solar panels. It did that survive was a, the lunar night, which it survived the them. lunar night. Yeah, exactly. And then with the Odysseus lander, it it's the first 
private commercial lander i i guess sent from the u.s because the the japan the slim lander was not commercial while the previous yeah. one that was a japanese so this was like the first commercial lander that touched down gently ish on the moon <laughs> and then it fell over broke its leg and fell over sideways like how of course we, we're in these early stages where everything is a mess and i just think you can't come at it with this binary i i'm did not it asking for did binary it fail? i'm asking i know i know set your requirements and yeah. then compare it against that yeah and and there were some low-hanging fruit that i'm hoping simply haven't been published that i would have been would have expected so it's possible to track things on reentry from the ground with uh, a really good telescope mount uh, amateur astronomers can do this if they have the right systems. Um, and they were providing Starlink uh, conveyed video from Starship as it came down. But I would have liked to have the partner ground chasing imagery that would allow them to know, yes, it vaporized rather than, as I'm sure we will see on the internet, was like captured by aliens or fell into right I, you know there's going to be conspiracy theories yeah. and that booster came in hot mm -hmm. and it there should and there should have been telephoto imagery of that and chase planes um sure but, i want to see but who knows, hitting like... the ocean at mach 2 <laughs> i want to see hitting the ocean yes. at mach 2 what what we saw was was the grid fins trying yeah. to compensate. It was getting a bigger and bigger wobble until they until the the scene shut, and that's because the thing went well. Right. And and so there are some really interesting discussions, and of course, there's going to be an FAA investigation that will reveal what actually happened. But some of the discussions of how um, at supersonic speeds you have uh, delayed. Uh, reaction times due to the shape of the shock wave and the outgassing that they did could have affected the shape of their shock wave causing the grid fins to have a laggy response to mm -hmm, what was mm -hmm. going on there was super cool physics learned i'm i'm totally fine with what happened with the booster um i'm i'm i want to know why we didn't have ground-based imagery like with with the, the space shuttles we learned that there was adaptive optics because it turned out we were able to go back and look at the ground-based imagery in the 80s so if you set 10 goals for your mission and you accomplish uh -huh. five of them and then the other five are either straight up failures or partial successes was your mission a success or a failure so they get to decide ahead of time this is mm -hmm. our minimum bar I'm for success so if the, they set their minimum bar for success is the first three goals, I'm good with that. I just want them mm. to say ahead of time. That's all I'm asking okay. is say ahead right. of time. Okay. All right. All right. All right. I, I, I think you should say ahead of time anyway, or, or don't. Like, it's the or don't allows. So what we're seeing right like, now Like, who cares? Is, like, so, why, like, why does it matter? Why does it matter whether or not they were but, successful or so so what's happening is you see people being asked what did you think and then mm -hmm. being criticized because if you say it was a success people are like well they didn't do what they said they were set out to do and if you say it was a failure people say what you yep. said and yep. so instead of being able to focus on the science, the engineering, and what was learned, people are thumping one another's noses. And you mm -hmm. can avoid that if you have a goddamn rubric. I think people need to learn how to live with nuance. Yeah. And I don't want to shy. I don't want to sh us to shy away from being able to talk in nuance. Yes. And I think to. You just froze in the middle of a very important thought, but with at least a good expression on your face. We, dear Zoom. There, you're back. What did you okay, say all right, before all right. you froze? That 
I think it's really important for us to learn to be able to have conversations that are complicated yeah. and nuanced where the outcome isn't black and white and that that to try to in advance require a way to then have a black and white conversation I think is getting away from life is complicated things have varying degrees of of what the implications are for that you know you can say like there's such important about about poverty about environmental damage about recycling plastics about vehicle use about all these kinds of things and in many cases the true answer is in having a engaging with a person who maybe has a different belief than you to have a complicated conversation about it to see pros and cons and to, for everybody to walk away understanding the situation better and and that, that is... i think is a instinct that we are moving away from to we need to be able to have a simple answer and oh, I, i'm not saying a simple answer yeah so for a me simple answer I'm able to just say it's complicated and I'm happy to explain it in, in nuance. And if you want to rant about me in the YouTube comments, then go to another channel. Go. That's like, I know watching Fraser Kane's videos on YouTube are mandatory. <laughs> and I, I'm, I regret how everyone is forced to watch my stuff. I know that's not fair. <laughs> Maybe in another, you know, we could have a more perfect world where people get to choose the shows they want to watch. But, but yeah, it's just like, it's so funny because people will rant at me about stuff like, oh, yeah. you're too much in, you're too much of an Elon hater. Like, why would you cut him any slack? And then someone else would be like, oh, you're too much of an Elon fanboy. I can't stand yeah. this channel anymore. And my response to all of them is just like, go away away this is not mandatory yeah. this is optional so you can choose to watch my stuff it's, or not. it's more than just personal it's it's trying to watch the conversation going on with everyone getting yeah and and this was the same thing that happened with climate change a number of years ago which is part of where the i think it was the paris climate agreement was like 1.5 celsius we're aiming for that folks we went past it last year yeah, yeah. But but with a with a like a bullet. Yeah. <laughs> but <laughs> but by setting these specific targets, it allows the conversation to move with fewer mm -hmm. peanut gallery people. And right now I'm just seeing conversation isn't possible. Yeah. And in other things we found just having a rubric is what makes the conversation even possible. Yeah, but and I think that like we should we should manage our emissions to 1.5 degrees, but then the big caveat is unless we're finding that other environmental issues are more urgent more quickly and they need to be focused on in a way that maybe shifts some of our yeah. requirements and we don't want to 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 go aggressive on things that aren't actually going to give us the downturn downstream benefits. So maybe we're going to have to slack in on that a little bit. And we also have to consider the effect on the economy as we try to make this transition to a, a more renewable resource. But we also need to consider the effect on poverty on countries that have very low climate emissions already and yet are being asked to help foot this bill that and like it goes on and on and on and on and on. And so I think it's, and I think that the people who cannot speak nuance can easily be ignored, should be ignored. And I don't think that we need to adapt our way of talking so that they can continue with that kind of behavior. I think instead we engage with the people who are capable of having nuanced conversation who will defend their truly held beliefs with honor and integrity and open-mindedness to where they could be wrong in their thinking. And I think the people who are unwilling to do that need to stop getting so much attention. 
as as Zizink puts it over on Twitch, it's like seeing an ad in a shop window for piano lessons and storming in shouting that you don't want piano lessons. That is how YouTube comments really feel. It really does. I, yeah. I posted a video last week uh, over on CosmoQuest about uh, all of the budget cuts and the consequences of the budget cuts over at NASA and a bit of there wasn't enough detail to go into NSF really. Um, and and how it's seriously impacting careers. Yeah. Um, and someone is just like, go get a real job. It's like, I, I thank you. <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, come back when you have some helpful advice. All right. We've gone over time, but that's because we started late. So we should yeah. probably wrap things up. So super fun, Pamela. I look forward to your article and I look forward to just slamming it with a single minded black and white perspective which i know you won't and you're just which I won't mocking do. me and i don't have a response because allergies i'm just gonna go with that <laughs> oh are you this is it this is this is my opportunity to to uh you know as you your addle your brain is addled by by histamines I, i'm gonna leave you with a thought from cybabe uh for moments like this when an asshole makes a comment, I don't respond right away. I wait 24 hours because I know I'll have a better response to them then. Mm. Yeah. So Good that's, advice. that's my brain. All Wonderful. right, everyone. All right. So um, much fun. Thanks, Pamela. Yeah. yeah we'll see you next week. Awkward ending, finding buttons, losing buttons behind windows. Ah, ah, too many buttons. Okay. Almost there. Almost there. Where's the transition? Bye.